On March 18, 2018, just outside of Tampa, Florida, 29-year-old Ronnie O'Neill III massacred his whole family, claiming that they were evil children of the devil. But one survived, his son, also named Ronnie, but we'll call him Little Ronnie to avoid confusion. He was only eight years old when his life took a devastating turn. Just before midnight, police received a chilling 911 call. During the first half of this phone call, no one was even talking, although there was a lot of noise on the other end of the phone. There was lot movement, shuffling, yelling, screaming. It was clear that there is a physical altercation happening, and eventually, a woman spoke. But she was frantic, gasping for breath when she said, God help me please, Jesus help, I'm shot. The operator then heard another voice in the background of the call. It was a man's voice repeatedly chanting, Allahu Akbar, which translates in Arabic to, God is the greatest. For the next part of this phone call, the woman was talking to the man in background and she was pleading with him. She tried to say everything she could think of to try to calm him down, but it wasn't working. He didn't respond to her pleas once. About a minute into this exchange, he shouted over her, she killed me. The operator couldn't really understand but was still trying to listen in. He continued to repeat, she kills me, she kills me, and then the line went dead. At this point, police were already speeding to the location of the call because it was clear that something was going on and someone needed saving. Before the police had even arrived, 911 received another phone call from the same address. But this time, it was a man on the phone. Most of it is quite senseless ramblings. He said, I've just been attacked by some white demons and he rounded it off with, her name is Kiki and she just tried to kill me and I killed her. The operator tried asking for clarification but the line went dead. The police zoned in on the location. They didn't know how to approach this so after about a minute, they got out of their cars, and that was when they noticed a woman collapsed in a heap on the front lawn. They called out to her to see if she was okay, but the woman didn't respond. They walked over, and realized she was covered in blood. Seemed as though she had been beaten with something heavy. She had teeth knocked out, part of her face was disfigured, and her bones were fractured in about 10 different places. This was a brutal attack. And so then and there, on the front lawn of the property, this unidentified woman was pronounced dead. And that was only the start of the horrors that police were going to find that night. As all of this had been happening out on the lawn, police had been alerted to a fire going on in the next house. They tried to break into the house and they couldn't get in the door, so they tried to kick in the garage door. But with it came a tall figure. The figure was clearly a man. They didn't know if he was armed. The police backed up a bit and shouted at him to freeze, and stop coming towards them. But he didn't listen. He was still walking towards him. They managed to get him down onto the floor and handcuff him so that they could put him in the back of the cop car. And the whole time that we're doing this, from the moment he was tased on the ground and they put the handcuffs on him, he started chanting, Allahu Akbar. So, presumably, this was the man that was heard on phone. He sat in the car ranting angrily about the woman named Kiki. He claimed that she was the devil and that the kids were the devil's children. It was at this moment that attention was shifted back to the house where a little boy emerged, staggering out clutching his stomach. He managed to walk into the garden before collapsing. The paramedics realizing that he was not older than 10, seeing the blood and huge gaping wounds on his abdomen rushed to his aid. The boy had burns, blisters from the fire, but one abdominal wound was so deep that his intestines were protruding. Little Ronnie uttered, my dad shot my mom. There were footprints, scuffs, and smears on the walls, indicating a struggle. The house also smelled strongly of gasoline, suggesting an attempt to set a larger fire which fortunately did not spread beyond the garage. This preservation of evidence led detectives to discover the body of a little girl in one of the bedrooms. She was identified as nine-year-old Ron Nivea O'Neill, Ronnie's daughter. Ron Nivea had suffered horribly. Her father beat her to death with a hatchet. Both deceased victims, Ron Nivea and her mother, 33-year-old Kenyatta Baron, also known as Kiki, were transported to the hospital. Kenyatta and Ronnie had two children together, Ron Nivea, and Ronnie, also known as Little Ronnie. He was the young boy who staggered out of the house holding his stomach and the only survivor of this horrifying incident. Initially paramedics and police officers at the crime scene doubted he would survive the journey to the hospital but miraculously Little Ronnie survived. Kenyatta and Ronnie were not in a relationship at the time of the murders. 
They had a long-term relationship previously, but they split up in 2012. Kenyatta got custody of the children and Ronnie was supposed to pay child support, which he quickly fell behind on. They hadn't seen much of each other until about five months before the murders, when Ronnie, involved in a random drive-by shooting, was severely injured. And with no one willing to take care of him, Kenyatta allowed him to stay with her, providing food and accommodation. This happy family of three was thriving without Ronnie, but everything changed when he re-entered their lives. They found that several noise complaints had been filed in the past five months, indicating fights, banging, screaming, and crying. The 911 calls provided crucial evidence. Experts enhanced the audio revealing a gunshot and sounds of beating in the background, aligning with the physical evidence of Kenyatta's murder. They heard Ronnie yelling at Kenyatta as he attacked her. A neighbor witnessed Ronnie standing over Kenyatta's limp body and shouting, she killed me, before lifting a shiny object, presumably a knife, above his head. James then retreated back into his house. This eyewitness account significantly bolstered the case against Ronnie. Ronnie decided to cooperate with police and shared his version of the events, claiming Kenyatta attacked him, leading him to kill her in self-defense. However, police were skeptical as there was no evidence of self-defense wounds on Ronnie, and the accumulated evidence, including the eyewitness account and the 911 audio, strongly contradicted his story. The case against Ronnie strengthened even further when his son, little Ronnie O'Neill, the only survivor of the attack, recovered and was able to recount the events. He had witnessed everything. He shared that the incident began with his parents arguing in their bedroom. He ran from his mother towards his sister, Renivea's bedroom and hid in the closet while Ron Nivea sat on her bed. Ronnie O'Neill then turned his attention to little Ronnie, ordering him to chant, Allahu Akbar. While doing so, little Ronnie heard a gunshot from his sister's bedroom, but did not see the event. Little Ronnie's testimony directly contradicted his father's story that Kenyatta had attacked him. The trauma that little Ronnie faced was immense. Having to witness his mother and sister's murders, and experiencing his own near-death situation, and then having to recount these events to the police and in court to a judge. Ronnie O'Neill I.I.'s trial began in June 2021, facing multiple charges, including two counts of murder, one of attempted murder, the second of child abuse, and finally arson. Ronnie decided to represent himself, confident that he could defend himself against these charges without legal representation, despite warnings from many, including the judge, about the high risk of self-representation, especially with the death penalty at stake. During the trial, Ronnie insisted on his original story told to the police, claiming that Kenyatta had attacked him and he acted in self-defense. He argued that she posed a threat, not only to his life, but also to their children's lives. However, his defense was immediately discounted in court as there was no evidence supporting his claim of self-defense. A particularly disturbing aspect of the trail was Ronnie's cross-examining of his own son, who had given detailed witness statements and was now confronted his attempted murderer in court. Little Ronnie appeared via video link recounting the night's events, including the argument between his parents over Ronnie, his insistence that Kenyatta converted to Islam. Ronnie's version of events included claims that his son was coached by the police to frame him. Throughout the trial, Ronnie represented himself poorly, at times doodling on papers and displaying messages to the jury, attempting to garner sympathy. However, these efforts were futile. Ultimately, Ronnie O'Neill was found guilty on all charges. The jury was split on the death penalty, so he received three consecutive life terms plus 60 years, ensuring that he would never be released from prison. As for little Ronnie, his recovery was long, painful, and lonely. With his mother gone and his father in custody, he lacked close family. Detective Mike Blair, one of the lead homicide detectives on the case, and also one of the first officers at the crime scene, noticed little Ronnie's isolation and began visiting him in the hospital. They formed a strong bond during these visits. Mike and his wife Danielle eventually decided to foster little Ronnie, offering him a loving home and a chance at a happier life. Little Ronnie's resilience and recovery despite the horrors that he endured stand as a testament to his strength and the compassion of those who supported him through this ordeal.